uh, music I didn't like, which is what my parents were playing. My father uh, played guitar, and my dad, you know, he was playing Johnny Cash and stuff like that, which I, I kind of liked from a young age. But um, and my my mother was the kid. came from the fifties, and uh, again, I didn't really like much then. And it wasn't until I don't know the when I was born in sixty one, probably until I was like nine or ten that I started listening to. I remember the first song that really I listened to that, that scared me was a whole lot of love with that that shit in the middle, you know the zoo, zoo, yeah all that stuff yeah. And it's like, well, what? what, what I, 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 like, yeah, yeah. And I was, I was like, what the hell is that? You know, so, it was that, like, I mean, that can make it. Yeah, it was. So like, then, it was it, it, it. That middle part is like, my penis is getting hard. What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I knew anything about that then, but um, <laughs> the way the sound, the way the, the sound was really left to right, and I was like. And I never heard anything like it before. And it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't like a couple more years until I, you know, I started got to get into Alice Cooper and Black Sabbath and the usual litany of but bands. But you. you, you grew up, you grew up on the Cape, correct? Right. Where, where, where on the Cape? Right in the middle, basically. Um, I grew up in Yarmouth, Yarmouthport. Yeah, Yarmouth. Yeah, I remember, yeah, I remember it. Yeah. Do yeah, yeah. I mean, by, people don't Barnstable and, you know, where the Kennedys lived and all that and, Right. You know, like we grew up like you know within walking distance of the ocean, which was nice. You know, right. Was and that, um, what was was I'm 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 assuming that like that area you'd get the Boston radio stations and FM, some of the you know all that, or was it uh, local stuff? Um, the, 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 well, well, both. I mean, I remember listening to the Oedipus' show, you know, at night. Sure. Um. And, you know, the Live at the Rat album. And we first heard punk rock. Uh, well, we, we first read about it um, uh, in Cream Magazine, which, you know, they carried it a few places in the Cave. And, you know, in 77, 70, I think it was 77, we heard Teenage Lobotomy. I remember the uh, Cape Cod Community College DJ uh, the, of the day. You know, he had to play something from a certain bin, you know, at, at a certain time. And he's like, okay, I don't know what this band is, the Ramones, but here's a song called oh, Teenage Lobotomy. <laughs> and, and he started playing it. And you know, as soon as it came in, me and, me and Rob Rosenthal, who you know, became Rob De Cradle and who started the band with me, um, you know, we, would, we both listened to it at the same time and we looked at each other and we were like, that's it. That's it. We could do that. Listen to that noise. <laughs> and it's like, wow. And so we went out, we played, and I remember we went to the, the one record store um, that would have a few of these things in Hyannis, uh, and uh, the, the albums that was like the Ramones, and we, but we spent like 200 bucks each, we got the, the, in the cutout bins, we got the Saints' first couple albums, the first album, the Stranglers' first couple, you know, the, whatever was out, and the Real Kids, um, I remember getting a Sex Pistols colored vinyl, because it hadn't been released here fully yet. Uh, the Damned first two albums. Anyway, and we liked everything we heard. Everything that looked remotely punk, we loved it. And so we used to go over there on a weekly basis and spend like 50 bucks a time. And then, then we, we heard about um, Newbury Comics up in Boston yep. when they first opened up. And, you know, they would have all the all the newest singles that would be coming out from, and that was, you know, from and that, over in England. And that, and that was when they were one brownstone on Newberry Street, it was like one, right. one, one little. It was, it was like comics on one side and records in the other, and it was like the size of your living room. Right, right. You know, it, it was great to go into. It was like going to a yard sale. Yeah. Well, right. I mean, going to a, to a, a, a like a house sale indoors. I mean, it's, you had to climb over piles of stuff that they had yeah, for yeah. twenty five cents or free bins and all kinds of. Stuff. Yeah, that was fun. You know, it's like you never knew what you'd find. But we'd always find something that we made that you know the 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 three hour total ride you know worth it for us. Sure. And um, and th that's what made us want to start the band. You know, this mm -hmm. finding a, a genre of music and a, a movement that that you know that we felt part of. Uh, we were too late for like you know I, I remember reading uh, reading about like the Abby Hoffman and the Yippies and how the Yippies were an activist group that basically were activated after they getting hit and hit it on the head by a cop, a cop's club. Right. And, you know, and, and not just sitting there like hippies did. And, 
And that's, that's kind of what I wanted to be like, you know, the up against the wall motherfuckers and the, all these different groups I was reading about. But they were all like either in jail or, or you know, become stockbrokers or something like Jerry Rubin. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, what, what, so there was too there was, we were ahead. too late for that, you know. No, we just say we were too late for that that stuff. So it's like it was great when punk came out because it combined both the music element that I liked and you know the attitude that I was drawn to. So was 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 it tough being? I mean, a quote unquote punk on the Cape back then. <laughs> yeah, at first we were just like I mean, you you were a punk on the Cape. I mean, if you just wear a, what you usually yeah. would wear, and if you just had a, had a, had a damned pen or something yeah. on. Get him! So, like, what Beat the fuck? Well, yeah. yeah. Get him! <laughs> broken, broken bones is a true story. Right. You know, that's... Like, we went to a party with a bunch of old friends at it, and it's... Um, they, you know, they, they, we, they started... A lot of their girlfriends, I guess, started talking to us or something, and then they started getting all mad or whatever, and and they didn't know uh, one of our guitarists. He was drunk there, too. But anyway, they, they just followed us out and kind of just, you know, then ran after us and just tackled us. And it was like, you know, it was like eight on three or something, you know, and we just got the shit kicked out of us and whatever. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, Boston, uh, or excuse me, Massachusetts is infamous for that behavior back then. It was like, you know, you'd have to you'd have to look around every corner and hopefully there's not like, you know, 25 you know uh bu jocks lurking around the corner you know yeah and i was just i just was reminded of that yesterday when i finally got a chance to see the documentary on the rat and i was hearing david minahan you know talking about you know getting this shit kicked out of him a bunch of times you know just by just because of walking out and looking like he did or what walking out of the rat looking like he did sure and uh, having all those BU jocks and stuff, yeah, we never really had any trouble with that. But it, it, it was pretty much settled in by the time we got up there. But you know what, Chris Hoffman just reminded us of something funny. Like, and I talk about those 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 early days when I was in Boston, right? And when you know when when we when I first shaved my head, and I'd be walking around with a couple of people, these. They had no reference point, so I remember like a car would drive by, and they would go, "Yo, fucking Devo." And we'd be like, yeah, beep, 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 we'd be like, Devo, Devo. Devo, like, what the fuck, Devo? Yeah, yeah. Like, like that was that was the big, like, you know, hey, fuck you, you know, Devo. And we'd be like, what? Yeah, yeah. That's what they knew. I mean, that's the stuff that got played. But it, when it was really the Dead Kennedys and the, you know, and the Sex Pistols and Clash that really got aggravated people to begin with, anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh. So how how does how does the um, the band start coming together? Were you were you musically inclined as a young person? How did you gravitate to starting the freeze? Uh, well, <laughs> listen to I Hate Taurus single if you want to hear if we're musically inclined. Only Rick Andrews on the bass could play it you know, at all. Um, we were lucky. We were really lucky to become a band at all because um, at first it was just me and Rob. Um, we went out with 20 bucks looking to buy guitars and amps and whatever. All we had was 20 bucks. And so we went to a yard, yard sale and we came back with a, um, a mic, a guitar, and an amp for 20 bucks. You know, the shittiest wow. pieces of, of, of yeah, instrumentation you could find. But, um, you know, and, and he'd play whatever riffs he was coming up with. And I'd sing, you know, with the mic plugged into the same amp as him. You know, a little foot tall type of thing. And, um, and you know, we, we actually... We had some wrote some of well, a couple of songs like Trouble If You Hide Me wrote way back then. That's a great song. Back in like seven seventy eight. It's one of the ones that's, that's lasted you know for us for me anyway. I still find it interesting to play. It's fun. Well, I know, I know, you know you sort of, I know you sort of you re-recorded it again later on for a later record, and and uh, it, it's it's I, it's great. It's one of the great early ones for sure. No thanks. American Town was one of the early ones too, along with you know I Hate Tourists and. Don't forget me, Tommy. Before we hit the rubber room was uh, one of the early ones too. That's so, off rapid reaction. So the band but, comes together. What was the original lineup? Well, the, you know, the, I'm say we were lucky to become a band because everybody that that was into punk at that time on on the Cape just happened to play a different instrument, and um, so it ended up being uh, me and Rob started it, and we got. This guy, this drummer friend of ours, Kevin Vichay, 
Um, he wasn't really into punk, but he, he he thought what we were doing was fun. Rick Andrews was the that was the main guy that really was into punk. Besides me and Rob, he was and he could like he could he was jazz trained as on a, on, a, on the bass. And I mean his 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 fingers fit on the strings just perfectly. I mean he could play anything. That guy. And the, I, people I, have, like, I, have a vivid memory. I have a vivid memory of him playing with you guys, and he was he was a, he was. Is it fair to say like he's sort of like I don't want to say the unsung hero, but but he I always he was a big part of the early band, right? Huge, yeah, absolutely. I mean, he was you know he I, before I learned to 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 act out a bit on stage, like it was it was Rick that was that was the show, pretty much, you know. And um, I mean, again, again, he could play his way out of anything too, you know. Oh, you punk rock, fucking you guys suck. You can't play a fucking... Oh, yeah, what? <laughs> yeah, just listen here's, to Rick. Here's a, here's a shot of him. Here's a shot of him with you at the Rat. Yep, yep. Yeah, yeah we and miss that, Rick. That, yeah? Yeah, we, we, we've been trying to get him to, like, you know, with technology like it is, you know, you can, you can, uh, you can garage band uh, one of a part of two, you know, it's a, from down to him and a song down to him, he could lay a bass line on it, send it back up to us and stuff. And we're trying to get him to do that. Bill, Bill Close says, you know, anyway, he's, he's been in touch with him. Yeah. But uh, he doesn't want to do it. And I don't know why. Um, but hmm. anyway, it's not, I mean, he's, he's still, we're still friends with him and all that. It's not anything that happened that way. It's just he doesn't feel like playing anymore. He was, I don't a, know. He was, it's sad. Yeah, I, I, you know, he was a big part of the band all those early times that, that, uh, that I saw you. Let's talk about um, how did this how did this come about? Because you guys got off the launch pad pretty early and got something recorded and out. You know, uh, this is what ni ni nineteen eighty. How did how did this I Hate Tourist single come about? <laughs> our first our, our manager, a friend of mine that I uh, got kicked out of Exeter uh, school, some private school in New Hampshire, um, from bomb making or something. He got sent down and he had to go to. Uh, to the same high school that I was in, so I naturally we gravitated towards him. And um, you know, we said it was instead of going out and getting drunk every night and whatever and just causing trouble and and he, he was like he used to get really pissed off at the at, at the at the traffic and the tourists and he, he was like he came up with a line, you know, I tourists, tourists suck, it's only the daughters I wanna fuck. And <laughs> and he, he goes, That's gonna be and I said, That's you gotta make a set's gonna be a song. He goes, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and he was dealing at the time. He was you know, in high school and not an outside, but he was dealing like mescaline and acid and speed and shit like this. And, yeah, we're talking like, you know, a junior or senior in high school. Right. And so, I mean, he had, he had saved like, the, you know, seven, eight thousand bucks or something up of his own. And he put us in the studio for a couple, three, two thousand of those. Um, again, he ran out of money to, to invest in this like about a halfway through. So we had to go into the school art department to steal the construction paper for it and shit like that at night. But like, <laughs> you know, like, that's just a thing do it yourself single, you know? It's like, I don't know how, like, you know, it could, it could sound any worse either, but it is what it is, you know? And if, and if, Bill, if, he, if Doug had never come up with that, came up with that line, you know, I hate tourist hooks, it's only does I want to fuck, we never would have got the attention on, of, on, of WBCN. Right. Uh, who played that? Who played that song every day that summer in 1980? Wow. Yeah, I remember it made like the top ten singles in Phoenix. I mean, on the Boston Phoenix yeah, that Boston year. Phoenix, yeah, it was the top ten local local singles of the year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then that you know that got us the that got us the, on the attention of uh, Modern Method. Uh, we went in and did First American Town for yeah. Wicked Good Time Volume Two. Yeah, and then the Boston Not Away stuff came up. Yeah. Did, did, um, was there any, was there any like blowback from the I hate tourist things that you like some, like, like some Christian group was carrying on and banned you or something? Uh, oh, my, my father, you know, working class, uh, he was a painting contractor. And I remember when, um, I wanted, you know, I, I we had the single and I was, you know, proud of the thing and I brought it home and played it for my parents. And my mother liked Don't Forget Me, Tommy. She goes, oh, that sounds very 1950s. I go, well, thanks. Wow. <laughs> and then we turn it over and play I Hate Tourists. And, you know, the the, 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 the chorus comes up. And uh, my father's like, God damn it. 
<laughs> you just you just you just lost me thousands of dollars, you know, with my customers. And like, why? Because they can't they can't hear like, like lyrics like that, language like that, and still want me in the house painting. I go, I didn't know all your customers listen to punk rock, Dad. You know, <laughs> when are they going to hear this? Yeah, and, and, and he just he stormed out of the room. He was pissed off, and, and it was then you know the next thing I played him was the first song on Land of the Lost when our first album came out. And all it took was like, you know, the first chord of American Town. He's like, oh, same old shit. And, you know, he, he, walks, he walks out of the room. But anyway, um, if, if, if my, my parents had both said, I, was, I always wondered this. My parents had both said, oh, that's cool. Glad you did that. That's cool. If it wouldn't have taken that of the fire out of me and I, I would have like, you know, just kind of moved on. That would have just dropped the idea. Right. I, always, I always wondered that. Because I mean, that really got me pissed off, and it was like, "Oh yeah, you think this is you think this is something? Wait till I get going." Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know, and like, and uh, here I am. I'm still going. You know, well, I'm not really right now, of course. I'm uh, I'm near dead in bed, but anyway. Um. <laughs> here's here's a a shot of uh, this is the place that I first saw you play. This is a media workshop. Um, oh yeah, Kevin yeah, Porter. Porter. Yeah, Kevin Porter Media Workshop and. Could you tell us, you know, what kind of places were there to play in it back then? Well, I, um, I, I, I get, I get confused with, you know, the, the, the timelines when I, when I go way back, like I do. I can only separate what happened when. This by, is like when this the is releases like came out. This is like 1981, uh, Media Workshop, and then later Gallery East. Yeah, I can't, wasn't Cantones around around that time, or yeah, Cantones, yeah. But but this was yeah. Kevin Porter's place. Kevin Porter's place that was up on the fourth floor. You know, uh, in this picture, you see Springer Springer standing there, and and uh, Steve from the from the FUs. But this this is this is where I saw you play. You know, you 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 guys used to play the media workshop a lot. Yeah, we did. We did. I mean, we played the rat a lot too. It was like the first place we played in Boston. Yeah, here's. And um, yeah, go on. I know a lot of I know a lot of the uh, people that came up around when we did. You know, preferred the uh, the all ages shows, like you know, at the places like that. And you know, I I I I, I like playing at the rat just as much as I did like you know playing those shows. Um, but any I mean anybody that was appreciative of it, you know, or get into it, so whatever. Or, or, or uh, hated it and reacted somehow. You know, it was fun to play in front of. You know, but we, we, I mean, we, there was no money in any of it ever. You know, so it wasn't about that at all. Yeah, here we go. You got, you got that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I don't know is, if that show ever happened. This is really well. This is uh, says uh, 1981. Here you are playing the Rat. It's a dollar admission on a mo on on a Monday night. See, I, I have no recollection of this show whatsoever. I mean, I, 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 I think I still have that, you know, this, this uh, little clip here uh, out of uh, the Phoenix. But um, the, the first show I remember playing at the Rat was right after that. I don't, cause I don't think this show happened. But um, or I don't know if we made it or not. But it was with uh, the Outwards, and I'll always remember that because that's when we met Walter Gustafson. Yeah, and I remember Walter. Walter, I was standing with Lou at the back, and we were kind of nervous, you know, because the rat was had such a a legendary you know name to it already, and you know we were playing with a band, the Outlets, that we had already heard and you know liked a couple songs we heard by him, and um, they were headlining it. I remember Walter, big, just big guy in a leather jacket, kind of came walking up to me and Lou, and he goes, "Are you Lou?" And he goes, "Yeah, I'm Walter. I, I play drums in the Outlets," and, and he has a he has a briefcase with him. He goes, would you like a drink? <laughs> and he opens up his briefcase, and he's got like a little mini bar with him, you know. And, and right away, you know, he's like, oh, yeah, sure, have a drink, you know, whatever. And he just, he just, we got along with him right away and stuff. And we got along with the Elwoods great. You know, and we had a fun time. They were, they were. And that was like, oh, they were always great to see. I mean, no matter what music you were into, you know, how hard or how new wave or whatever, they were right down the middle, so you, you could, you'd like something by them, you know. And they always had some energy to it too. And always fun, and all the girls always wanted to see them, and all knew, they all knew the lyrics. And you know, we were like like a, a an anti girl. I mean, I, yeah. no 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 women would ever come see us. You know, why would they? You know, no, no women. But, no no women would no women would even come within a ten mile radius <laughs> when, when you when you. Yeah. 
when you guys play. Yeah, this, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, not, this is uh, the rat, but this is later. I know this is later, but uh, yeah, because it's kept playing. Yeah, so this is this is, uh, but this is the rat, the infamous rat. You know, this is probably what 83, 84? Yeah, I think so. Yep. Yeah, because I I know I know what from the shirt Bill's wearing. Two minutes yeah. hate. That was a yeah. band. He was uh, he was in right before us. He he joined us at thirteen years old. You know he was wow. He uh, he played on Guilty Face. Yeah, he was thirteen. I think fourteen. Yeah. First time he played with us. Yeah. Yeah. Um. An, that's been one of the, that's, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say that's been one of the more satisfying things about being in the band this entire time, mainly with Bill. You know, for most of the time, is is watching it, like you know how we grew as a guitarist and songwriter right. you know he, he's I'll, ne I'll never be able to find a writing partner as talented as that guy you know it's like you know he could he could take the generic riffs that i would come up with and he could make them sound a little bit better than that you know yeah and you know we always said that like you know the lyrics he came up with he didn't want to sing in public and you know i could usually add what he wanted to have on the riffs he'd come up with too so we just kind of were meant to kind of write together. So that's worked yeah. out really well. Yeah, it's kind of like what I did with my band. Like, when, 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 you know, someone will write a song and hand me some lyrics, and I'll be like, yeah, I'm not singing that. <laughs> you know, or, or yeah. I, I, I like the general idea, and I'll work off that idea, but, you know, I'm not. I'm not oh, it was funny. That's kind of a running joke with Bill Close and stuff. He was the youngest one in the band, and it was for the first couple albums. There was always there was be a song that he wouldn't want to play. You know, he give me the music for uh, no. It was like what was it? Uh, it was um, uh, what the hell was it? Uh, oh, so long ago on uh, on uh, Land of the Lost, Lost, where you know my garden is full of little girls that have crushed beyond repair. They decayed. <laughs> I'm not singing. I'm not playing in a song about serial killers and. I go, Bill, Bill, it's, it's, it's a meta but, metaphorical. Yeah. I go, it, it's, the, the, the garden is the memory. You know, it's like, not, it's not like what you're thinking. It's not, I'm not promoting serial killing and, and being, killing girls and little babies and burying them in the backyards and stuff well, like that. The, the backyard is the memory, you know, and it's just looking at that way. He goes, oh. <laughs> but, I'll play on, but I'll play on refrigerator, I'll play on refrigerator heaven, which is about, you know, a kid locking himself in a refrigerator and suffocating. I draw the line uh, with that one. <laughs> you know, he didn't play on that. Oh, okay. he, that was recorded. That was recorded during the uh, the, the um, uh, Boston Out Late session. Yeah, here you go. But it didn't come out till later. Yeah. Let's, and um, about, that was that was one song that didn't make it. Right? Let's it's let's talk about uh, this session and uh, this whole Boston Out LA thing. Uh, how, how did it come about? Um, like uh, Mike Dries said in the intro, you know, you guys were like one of the first bands on board with this. Could you explain to us like how this came about? How how did this come across your radar screen? Uh, well, we we really been with Modern Method because of the um, the American Town uh, song that they put on the Wicked Design Volume Two compilation. And, you know, we got along pretty good with Mike Trees and John Bruska. You know, they own Newbury Comics and we're starting to label up. John Bruska. I forgot about that guy. Yeah. Yeah, did you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's, he's easy to forget about. He's a quiet guy. Nice yeah. guy, though. I mean, they're, they're both nice guys. Yeah. And, um, you know, they, they kind of saw that we were the one band that they had a kind of a close relationship with that, we also had a relationship with some of the newer hardcore bands. You know, we were seemed like we were one of the only bands. Also, maybe Rupper and the Stains from Maine. Remember them? Yeah, yeah. Anyway, wait, wait. Was, was, was 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 Smeg was Smegma in Leper? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Smegma and the Nuns. But that was later after Leper. But um, it was after Leper and the Stains were were the only bands that like. You know the the hardcore could play with the hardcore crowd, and in the end, it really was only us that really could. Yeah, those bands like broke up. But anyway, they saw the really connection with the hardcore, you know, kids, other bands, and stuff, and they asked us to, you know, to talk to them and see who'd want to do what, and you know, and they they thought they wanted Gang Green right away. Gang Green were I had already got into the uh, 
you know, let's see who can play the fastest. And, <laughs> yeah. and you know, gangrene, they won that one. You know, they won that one hands down. I mean, I'm going to first. I think we, we might have got Dan Green their first club show. We had him on a Mill Hill Club. And, um, you know, and I remember. Let, let me, uh, Lori Dawn asks, uh, was, was, was Mill Hill on the Cape? Yeah, yep. It was in Yarmouth. It was probably a, a mile, about a mile away from where I grew up. Mm -hmm. And they, they used to have new rave nights there. <laughs> And then they started doing pretty well with them and stuff. So they started. They, I, they, I told the manager that you know I was kind of friendly. We were kind of friendly with them. We had a band, and I gave him the "I Hate Tourists" single. He thought it was funny, and he goes, "We want to play a show. We can give you an afternoon." And I was like, "Cool, that's what. Yeah, that'd be great." And you know, we want an afternoon. And I remember that's one of the first shows we we did. We had Gang Green come down. Um, we had some cool shows back then. We had Gigi Allen come in to play at the Mill Hill Club um, after that EP, of his four-song EP, Up Against the Wall, came out. And we had uh, Black Flag come down and play there. I remember that show. I remember that show. Yeah, that was wild. I mean, that, that, that was a turning point right then. That's when you knew, like, you know, Hot Girl like, had his fans, you know, well, like, outside of just the big city. Everyone says Mill Hill is an assisted living place now. It is. It's true. It's true. So the wow. next time I go to Mill Hill Club at the play, we'll probably be I'll be playing with you know, toys in one of the rooms there. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, if, I, I, like I was telling you earlier, I'm, I'm 63. I'll be 63 next week, and it seems like the only place that I can go and feel young is like a nursing home. <laughs> I must be playing the UK subs and the oldest guy in the room now. It's like God. Here's, here's a shot, um, and, and, you know, I had all these shots, you know, in this folder from when I made the Boston Hardcore film, but this one was labeled, uh, you know, you guys, this is you guys recording uh, Boston Not L.A. Uh, tracks. I guess, was Walter with you then? No, but he, um, no. But uh, that's, that's Walter right there on the left. Yeah. Yeah. I got that um, one, and I got this one. I got this one too. It says the freeze recording. This is Boston, not LA. Here's a shot of you. Uh, interestingly enough, at the at the board reading a. I think that's you or Chuck. No, that's you. Uh, reading a book or a fanzine or something. Uh, we had well, yeah. And I, I would read. I would be given fanzines, or we had our own fanzine out too for a while called First Defense. Oh, yeah, I remember that. That looks like it might be a copy of that, do you? Yeah, yeah we had like four or five issues. The, 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 the main part of that people wanted to read was the Ask Rick Andrews, you know, column. <laughs> Where, you know, Rick, could you explain toe sucking to us? You know, and, like <laughs> here's and you know, he always. Here's oh, another one. Here's another one. Uh, it looks like recorded. I, I I don't know who this is. Do you? That's Bill and Lou. Yeah. So this is you. Did they play on the Boston on LA stuff? We did. Yeah. And Bill was there. Bill was there. He watched it. Um, but the, the Boston on LA stuff was yeah. It was it was the I hate Taurus lineup still. Right. Okay. Yeah. It wasn't yeah. until um, Rob left after um, Boston on LA. And that Bill joined for Guilty Face, and he's you know been with us ever since. And here is an ad. Were you? I mean, I don't think anybody has as many tracks on this thing as you guys. You you guys have there's uh there's eight eight tracks on this thing, and 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 you guys are pretty well represented on this thing. Yeah, no, it's like I, 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 you know, it wasn't my idea to have it titled that either. But um, right. I suppose it was a good marketing ploy by Modern Method because it got people talking about it. You know, it got people to take sides and you know whatever. But anyway, it, it had nothing to do. The song has like you said, you played in your intro. It has nothing to do with what, what people think it has to do with. You know, scene against scene. Yeah, it was you know. Um, now we were we were well represented on it because we were the first one to be asked on it, and we had we have uh, we recorded three other songs that didn't make it under this. Um, I'm too good for you, and we're not the abnormal ones. We recorded oh. for this, but the, but they weren't uh, time wise. They had to be left off of it. They didn't, nobody heard them until they came out on Token Bones, like in the late '90s. And then Refrigerator Heaven was what's that? 
and then refrigerator have been turned up on this. Right, right. Yeah. Right. I kind of wish it didn't, but it's a great. You know what? That's a great track, man. It's a. It's a. It's. A I really, like that. It's a great track. It was fun to play live. I can't. Again, I. I. I can't. I don't know. I can't sing it anymore live. Just I can't get into the uh, the persona of the of the person I'm singing about. You know, mm -hmm. hey Cliffy, quit your stalling. You haven't eaten since last night. In refrigerator heaven, you'll spoil your appetite. Yeah, you know, it doesn't have the same. It doesn't have really any effect on me anymore. So right. I'm not going to think it. Right. Uh, did uh did the did the whole Boston not LA and like that drama and that controversy was that a little bit of an albatross around your neck for a while? To a degree, I mean, like you know, everybody would say what a stupid title it was for the album and all that, and yeah, and you know, and I, I'd be asked by everybody, you know. Why, why, what's wrong with the Boston bands? I mean, it's, 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 nah, nah, nah. Uh, uh, you know, like, yeah, damn right, Boston bands are the best. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, and everyone was getting so heated about it, you know. I'm just glad that after a couple few years, it just all settled down. It, it hasn't gone away, but it's just, you know, everyone has just gotten older and they yeah. just kind of roll. Well, everyone learns to relax a little bit, even me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, did this did you know and i was around back then and and i was a teenager and uh you know i sort of i, w I wouldn't say that i would i would i don't know if it's fair to say i re regret some of my behavior but i definitely had had you know blinders on as a as a teenage kid then that was into hardcore you know and uh was there was there any kind of um what's the best way to put it you know, uh, tension with, with some of the, with, with like SSD control or the Boston. I mean, I remember there was a little bit of a divide. Any comment on that? And, you know, without, without, no, hurting, I, any, without hurting any feelings per se, is there, is there a nice yeah, yeah. way to explain that? <laughs> well, I, 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 I guess, man, it's all been explained by me before. So it's like, yeah. it doesn't really, and people know, and I, you know, I, I get along with everyone now and, you know, yeah. I talk. I talk to Al, you know, now and then, and I've always been friendly with Springer, and yeah. and um, anyway, I got I got no beef with anybody from back then. At the, but at the time, um, you know, once Boston Metal A came out and SSD Control, Al didn't want to be on that, you know, because it was put out by a, by corporate Newbury Comics, even though it was just about as do it yourself a thing as you know as you could do as you could have. Without you know, without actually putting it out yourself, and we learned we learned how hard that was with I Hate Taurus because although you can a band can do the DIY thing completely and you know put the stuff out yourself, you don't have the you don't have the name you don't have the mailing lists you don't have the distribution that you know the labels have, right. and like so you you can't really get it distributed. I mean, sure you can advertise and fanzines, but you need money to do that. You, you know, you don't get paid at shows, although you, you know, not, not enough to do that. I mean, you know, coming up from Cape Cod and back, we, you know, which it cost a hundred bucks gas, mainly just to go up and back for a show. And that's basically what we, what we were getting paid, you know? And again, it wasn't about the money. It was just, the, and we just saw Boston Night LA as a way to get our songs distributed further, which did happen with that, you know, I guess yeah. it's become... And the best-selling compilation in Boston or something? Yeah, yeah. And, and just, just want to point out that early on, like, this is this is SSD Control's first show ever. You guys are on the bill at the Gallery East, and you guys used to play with them all the time early on. There, there wasn't a lot of bands around. There was Early on, it was The Freeze and SSD and, you know, and then some of the others followed suit. But early on, you, you were on all these bills, man. No, we played with all those bands, and we were like we were like the one band that seemed like that like all the hardcore kids would you know seemed to want to could would gravitate to it you know yeah. would come see us and stuff. I remember you know when all these people had hair. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember when uh when I remember when that uh, choke was uh, Jack Kelly, yeah. that's his real name, and uh, you know he lived in he lived in Provincetown, on on the Cape, yeah, yeah. and um. Yeah, and you know he 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 had spiky hair like like Billy Idol did you know when I first met him, and um and he used to come to our shows all the time you know Al had hair he was at our shows all the time, 
And um, then all of a sudden, the Boston LA thing came out, and the straight edge thing happened after after, after minor threat. Right. Right. And that's what kind of drew. And you know, they came. I remember uh, what was it? Uh, no expo- forced exposure. Yeah, um, magazine. Yeah, I mean they they were um, they were looking for to put the first issue out or something, and they were looking for uh, advertisement bands to you know pay to take some ads out in it, and they could they approach us you know after one of one show that we played a terrible show, and we had gotten like seventeen dollars or something. We didn't have any money for gas even to get back hardly, and um you know we wanted to take an ad out sure we didn't help out but like we didn't have any money. I remember one of them. I'm not going to name any names, but somebody would, somebody said to us, said to us like, "You regret this," and like, oh, "Okay, we we'll regret it. Fine, whatever." And um, and the the first issue came out, and it was the first, you know, the editorial page, all big pro SSD control and why you know straight edge is great, and the freeze and the drug use and the drinking and all why they suck. And you know, and, and that kind of drove the wedge in it. And you know, yeah. th- after that, I wrote, I wrote no exposure, ex- exposure because you know, the, no forced exposure. We review a show like when we played with the Dead Kennedys. Our own manager, of Doug Harry, is the one to put that show together. You know, the Waltham show, mm-hmm. the the huge one. And um, you know, they review, they review that show and wouldn't even mention that we played it. You know, it's <laughs> it's like really we have to get that petty. You know, and. Again, it doesn't it doesn't matter in the long run, but I mean, like, yeah. But it was just kind of it was just so petty at the time, and it's like, and like you, you were saying, like the tunnel vision thing. Think outside the box. I mean, you don't just think in the box, you know. It's like, and how how did how we didn't we didn't change, you know, from when you liked us last week. <laughs> so I mean, you know, what happened? You know, yeah. sorry, you know, I I. Whatever. So I'll now and then I'll have a drink. I don't drink really anymore. I can have I drink probably a beer or two a year or so. But I mean, you know, and I, we did a little speed back then or something. Big deal, you know. Here's but, a, um, a and, from, from back then, actually, uh, this is probably around that era. Broken Bones, Now and Never, Halloween Night, maybe eighty four. A uh, guilty face. Uh, could be as early as eighty three. Yeah. Yeah, because we've got the songs from um, from Guilty Face on it, and nothing, uh, and, no, nothing, nothing that was written for or well, Nazi fun. I so, said, yeah, probably 80, 83 or eighty four. Anyway, yeah, okay. Yeah, no, Nazi fun was the first song uh, on uh, that was I saw on that anyway. That was only on Land of the Lost. Yeah, you know our first album. But um, be- before we get to Land of the Lost, I just want to touch on this, which which is kind of a. a a great release that I don't want to say slipped through the slipped through the cracks, but th- this was the last one. Th- th- this was of that era that was really on my radar screen. This guilt, guilty face seven inch. This was great. Oh yeah, that's that's the um, that's the Rick Andrews influence. The last of it, pretty much in there. But Rick wanted to take us in the completely in that direction. Um, uh, more, he he wrote the music for Guilty Face, the song Guilty Face. And part of like another one, uh, Voices from My Window, I think. And um, he wanted to take us in more of a, a hardcore avant garde kind of direction. And we wanted to we wanted to do what we mainly did on on um, on Land of the Lost is like basically, you know, write some good m- melodic, punchy two minute songs, you know. Yeah, yeah. We could sing along or something with, and that's kind of you know that we decided to go there, and Rick went you know his own direction. Yeah, um, you know, around this time, I, I got I gotta say that, um, and and you may not remember this, but um, you we played the first time I ever played publicly with a band, we played together. It was this this show. I I. I I sort of this show was in town, right? This show was happening the next day, right? This was happening the next day at the Gallery East, and government issue and double O was in town. So this is so what we did was we snuck all the equipment into the Fens Gate uh, dormitory at Emerson and up to the fifth floor lounge in the where I was going to school. And we did a show in the fifth floor lounge. It was the Mighty CEOs, the band I was in. First time I ever, you know, played publicly. Band you guys played, Government Issue played, and Double O played. 
in this fifth floor lounge at Emerson. We dragged all the shit up there. It was crazy. There was like 25 kids there. And uh, yeah. I'm sure you have. Oh, wow. Yeah. No, I don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I do. I, I do remember. Maybe somebody else does, but it was the first time I ever performed in a van. And uh, oh, really? yeah, everyone remembers the first time. Huh? <laughs> but we, spent, we, we like brought the gear in through the front door of this, of this dorm, we took the elevator up to the fifth floor. They have like a student lounge and we set up the gear and we had like a fucking show there. It's crazy. 19. Yeah. No, it, yeah. 83? Eight, eight, no, it was 82. Was it really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it was uh it was 82. Let me let me let me ask you about um, you know, we're gonna get to, oh well, here's another one. Here's another one from 82. I'm sure you don't remember it, but I have the flyer. Once again, we were on the same bill. It was at at Gallery East. I was in the Mighty CEOs, Mighty CEOs, the Freeze Gang Green, Jerry's kids. Uh, it was, uh, I think, Shred. Remember that kid, Shred, had that. Uh, sure. Yeah, yeah, he had that fanzine, and uh, we it was like a benefit or something for his fanzine. So this is '82. We played together in 1982, 42 oh, yeah. years ago. You know? Yeah, I know. No, that's, that's quite a quite a chunk of time, Drew. Yeah. Um, yes, Brian Baker from Minor Threat was the guitar player in Government Issue. That's right. Oh, that wow. is, really? Yeah, that's right. Oh, wow. Yeah. Hey, Sean McNally. Hey, Sean McNally says, what's up? Hey. Way hey, Sean, how you doing, Sean? What's up, Cliff? Yeah. Yeah, I'm telling you, right, Lori? Yo, in our dorm room. It, was, it, not, it wasn't my dorm. I was across the street. But, uh, but, but it was uh, in the fence gate. So uh, let me see what else I got from, from, that, from, that, from that era. That before, before, yeah, no, I, I remember. I remember I'm seeing those uh, those flyers. I just don't remember the shows in particular, but because yeah, I, I collected all the flyers back then. This, this kind of this kind of sums up some of the great, great. Uh, and these were little shows, you know. Looking back, you think a show like this would be huge. It's SSD Control, Gang Green, The Freeze, FUs, and Jerry's Kids at the Media Workshop. And keep in mind yeah. that the Media Workshop was the side. It was like one little room. Yeah, place. Th that's a that's a classic flyer, I think. Yeah, yeah. You know, because it's got it's got all the bands together, probably for the last time. Yeah, yeah, I agree. You know, and yeah. and no, I, I think that was I do I do remember this. Yeah, yeah, and this is this is uh, Sunday, January third, nineteen eighty two. So we just went into nineteen. This is nineteen eighty two, uh, like the first two days of nineteen eighty two, and these were the kind of great shows. Uh, that 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 were that were happening. So um, let me take a a sponsor break, a quick sponsor break. Yeah, right. Isn't that that's a crazy lineup? Let me take a quick sponsor break. Uh, let me go through a couple things. We'll come back. I want to talk about uh, Land of the Lost, the tour you guys did. Got a bunch of other pictures, and we'll move forward. Okay, I'll see you in about five ten minutes. All right. Sounds sounds good, Drew. Okay. There you have it. This is the New York Carco Chronicles live. Sorry for the little weird glitch, everybody. I don't know what happened with, with the show starting up on YouTube, but we're up on YouTube now. Our guest today is Cliff Hanger from The Freeze. Uh, we're excited to have our old friend on, and uh, we're going to be chopping it up a bit more. Uh, we'll be taking your questions, so on and so forth. Let's hear from some sponsors. Here we go. Since 1992, Generation Records has been a mainstay of the New York metropolitan area music scene. Today, they offer a diverse selection of new and used rock, jazz, indie, hip-hop, punk, hardcore, metal, blues, soundtrack, and reggae LPs, as well as t-shirts, posters, and other merchandise. They buy used record collections and music memorabilia and will pay you top dollar for them. House calls made for large collections in the tri-state area. Call or email generationrecords at gmail.com and follow them on Facebook and Instagram. Be cash or in debt. Do you mean debit? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Another eternal satisfying customer. <laughs>
Hey guys, Vlad from Organic Grill. As you can see, we're in a new location on West 3rd Street, right by Blue Note and Comedy Cell. The place is bigger, kitchen is bigger, we have more varieties, more food. We are looking forward to treat you guys with great dishes. All Hardcore Chronicles, welcome to, to Organic Grill. We are going to serve all the events as we usually do. And we are happy to see you guys. Peace, what it do? Welcome to NYT Comics at 117 Main Street, Dobbs, Surrey, New York. I'm Debo the Pro with my homie. Lee Farley. Welcome to the spot. Specializing in yesterday's and today's comic books, rare CGCs, toys, collectibles. Got skateboards, old school tapes, Magic the Gathering, Warhammer. Video games, original art, original art pieces by your favorite New York City and worldwide artists. Let's go! Skate decks all day, baby! We also have the young reader section here for like 10, 10 and under. Uh, pops, people love the pops. Star Wars! <laughs> We are New York Hardcore. We always rep the scene. Let's get it off. What are you saying, Lou? That is it my volume level is low? Is that what you were saying? Let me know if my volume level is low. Um, it's uh it's usually uh it's usually the same. Nothing's really changed. Uh, let me know. Let me know what's going on. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. Let's talk about a couple of upcoming shows. Um, this Sunday. This Sunday. Right? Yes. In a couple of days. Finally. That's right. My volume's okay. All right. Listen, Lou, you got to get with the program. It's you. It's not me. Uh, nothing's changed over here. My volume's always been pretty much... Uh, the same. Let me know if anybody else has any issues. This Sunday, April 14th, John Connolly from Nuclear Assault will be on the show. Guest host, Howie Abrams. The new music show is Wednesday, April 24th. We're going to be marching a cavalcade of stars through the show. Sunday, April 28th, Sal and Dan from Electric Frankenstein, co-hosted by Joel Ghostin, as in Boston. Uh, uh, Sunday, May 5th, uh, Sal and Bruscato. From Typo Negative, this is going to be a good one, formerly A Life of Agony. Our old friend Peter Spire, filmmaker, musician, author, uh, Sunday, May 12th. Another Minor Threat alumni, Sunday, May 19th, Steve Hansgen uh, from Minor Threat, Government Issue. Speaking of which, Second Wind, Dot Dash, and Poisonous H. We just announced this one. Yo, it's the Castle Heights reunion with Gary Mutley from Billy Club Sandwich and Phil Vibes from Irate. We're also going to have a couple of uh, special guests. Yeah, it's the Castle Fights reunion. Wednesday, May 29th, Chris Enriquez, uh, who just uh, joined Orange 9mm. Uh, he's in Spotlights and a couple other bands. Old school. There's some old school New York right here. Jack Rabbit uh, from The Big Takeover. He was a drummer in Even Worse coming on the show. So lots going on. Please support the show on Patreon. Yo, Show needs sponsors. Show always needs sponsors. Uh, needs patrons. Needs your support. Um, so please get on Patreon. It's been a while. Things are okay. But if you watch the show and you enjoy, if you watch the show and you enjoy the show, please support the show. You know everybody likes free, but you know, come on, support the show if you can. We would uh, we would appreciate it. Um, is that right, Lou? Uh, I got the show on three devices, three separate notes, and it's the same here. Not just I'm just reporting Roy. No, I appreciate that. Um, I appreciate that. I'm not sure what's um, what's different. Um, you, <laughs> my uh, my volume, my volume is is what it is. I'm, I'm not sure what, or I can't really even control my volume. Or can I? Um, I don't want to stop it. No, it is what it is. We'll have to live with it. Um, is that right? Uh, I texted Cliff to ask him to speak more quietly. So I expect 
he will start screaming instead, being the contradictory fellow he is. All right, relax. <laughs> uh, that said, what else? Um, yeah, let's bring Cliff back on. Let's get crazy. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, Jeff. How's that, Scott? Is there that better? Go. Yeah, I'll look at it. I'm going right. to lower you a little bit. How's that? Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm already laying down in bed. You know? Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's a casual, it's a casual show. Um, <laughs> it, Anthony, Anthony go on says, uh, Anthony says the freeze is one of my favorite bands of all time. Thanks for always making music that fires me up. Much love. Thank you, Anthony, for listening. Thank you. Thank you for listening to my misery. <laughs> Basically, that's what it's about. Or like the, uh, I, I can't. I don't know. Some of the stuff that I write about, like if I listen to it for too long, I'll 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 start having suicidal ideations, you know, or or I write from having suicidal ideations. You know, it's uh, kind of a miraculous. I'm still here in a way, but it it kind of is, and I'm glad you're here. I chased you around for a couple years to get you on this show. So, so I'm, 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 I'm really, I'm glad you're here. And, you know, and I got to say that in doing my homework for the show um, and, you know, delving into your catalog, you know, I'm very familiar with the early stuff, uh, but, you know, listening to, to some of the later stuff, man, it, this stuff is just really great. And uh, musically, the band was really great. Uh, um, why? You know, one thing that's not available uh, on on these streaming platforms is all the stuff I'm familiar with. Um, you know, like um, the Boston, not L.A. stuff or, um, you know, uh, the track from Unsafe at Any Speed or Guilty Face. None of that stuff is, is available on streaming. Uh, I guess it just fell through the cracks with, with Modern Method or whatever. And no, it, it it somehow fell into uh, Casella's hands. Oh God! And although he's never even spoken with, I, I don't, I, you know, I'll, I don't care what I say about him as long as I'm truthful. Yeah, he, he's a fucking asshole. Mm. I mean, he's an interesting guy to talk to sometimes about music and stuff, and about you know a lot of the bands and stuff. But business wise, he's an asshole. I mean, it's like he's never even spoken to me about. Uh, releasing the Boston out LA stuff. And we would never, you know, let him do that. Yeah. And modern method would never work with him. And, um, suddenly I went on to BMI, uh, my account one day. And I, I just happened to take a glance at a couple of songs. Cause we were having some trouble with Curtis on, on land of the lost and rabbit reaction. And as he was company. Um, and, I see that he that he's he's got he's got uh, the production credits for um for all the Boston Not LA songs and, and I mean including this is Boston Not LA. Mm. Curtis owns them. And I, how did you, you know, like, yeah. get them from Modern Method? I thought that was Newberry Comics Modern Method. I guess Modern Modern Method Modern I want Modern Method gave them to us gave them to me. Mm -hmm. Back um in uh, in their like ninety one or something when they we let them all come out on the Bitscore double dose album, right? That's when I think that that's when they that's when people first heard the uh, the other two songs that we weren't didn't make it onto I Boston out away. But I anyway, see. um yeah, that yeah they, so yeah it was and we all, I don't know maybe it was a bad thing but it shouldn't have been. Um, with, when we worked with Modern Method, it was always like did a gentleman's agreement. We never had to and have, had to have contracts written. Nothing like that. It was just a handshake, and we, you know, we just kept our word. So they did too, you know. And we went from that to Modern Method, uh, you know, uh, disbanding in '86, I guess, right after Rabbit Reaction came out, which kind of like put right, right, uh, which kind of blew it for us in a way. And we, we went to four years of basically nothing. Um, except doing too much speed and coming up with some weird stuff, we put it. We, we called it Ropes End. Anyway, um, it's, it's it's out there to listen to if you want to listen to it and get irritated. But um, anyway, then then Curtis pops up. Then then uh, Curtis pops up and like you know he, he wants to put out an album because he he heard 
four songs that I paid to record, you know, in the studio. And he put Misery Loves Company out. And then suddenly he owns uh, Robin Reaction and Land of the Lost and all the Boston wow. Mental Eight songs. And wow. he, he, claimed, he claims that Misery Loves Company never made its money back, even though Talking Bombs is on that. And his, the, you know, the Blood Lights Talking Bombs single is still in, in print. And, I mean, don't tell me fucking, like, you know, I mean, and you had a distribution deal with Roadrunner for a miserable company over in Europe, um, and that was Sony. And, and you can't tell me Miserable's company, which he only paid 2500 for the songs to record on it, I paid another 1000 myself for four of them, um, didn't make its money back. I mean, for him to say that is insane. Yeah. I and, mean, we've had people on the show. We've had people on the show before talking about Tang and how literally uh, he torpedoed their career. It, 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 it's come up a couple times. I mean, pretty sad. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah. I mean, you need you need to be like uh, like the like the Lemonheads or someone that has uh, the didn't the Boston's have trouble with them or yeah, the Boston's were on yeah. the label. I think I think they got bought off that label for a good chunk of change. Yeah, but you're going to have a major label lawyer behind you, like I think the Lemonheads did, uh, to, get, to get the rights back to their stuff or something. But anyway, but um, because, you know, we tried and tried to, to like, you know, to get back, uh, to get our stuff back. And we even talked to uh, the volunteer lawyers for the arts, you know, we can get free legal help and representation with. Yeah, yeah. Eddie, that's a good thing for other bands to know. The, the VLA, volunteer lawyers for the arts, if you have any trouble with them, um, with you, you know the copyright control or anything like that, or any any problems with 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 contracts and and labels, um, just get in touch with them and they'll they'll give you free representation if you, they think that you have something. Yeah, no, it is actually because I it took me forever to find it, and they have a they have a, a, uh, an office in every state too. Brian so. Sweeta, Brian Sweeta says my band opened up for the Freeze in San Diego and they burnt Curtis in effigy. <laughs> <laughs> that was that, that, I, I well yeah I'm sure we did you know I don't remember I'm not I'm not I'm not I'm not disputing that fact right yeah <laughs> I mean even, even if I we didn't I wish we did so there it is <laughs> I probably um, can't stand that guy it just he, now I'm going to be irritated for the rest of the show oh no well let me try uh, to change let me try to change it. let me try to change gears that, uh, this, this is. This is from uh, 1984, and uh, this is a Land of the Lost tour. And uh, starting in Phoenix, is that just, was that just um, a happenstance? Be, uh, was there Phoenix? Did you have a connection? Was there a connection to, to Phoenix back then, or was this just sort of random? That was random. Um, I remember yeah. that was that. I remember that show there. Um, we were the most excited to play of any of them because. The it was going to be social. Yeah. yeah, it was going to be social distortion. Wow. Bad religion, the circle jerks, and us. And then bad religion broke up at the time. Social distortion. Mike Ness went into rehab or whatever happened. Um, and uh, the circle jerks split up or something. They just one of them went into rehab, and it ended up being us and the meat men. Oh, the oh. meat puppets. I'm sorry. The meat. Right. The meat puppets. Right. Yeah, and it's like, are are the meat puppets? Are the meat puppets from Phoenix, or are they from Tucson? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah and yeah. I have nothing against the meat puppets. I mean, they're they're just not my style, and they certainly weren't as enjoyable to play with or listen to as the other bands would have been. Three of my favorite bands at the time, you know, that yeah. would have been a fucking unbelievable show. One of my best shows we ever played, if we played it. But it never happened. <laughs> it never will either. Although yeah. it could, but. Um, so, so looking, I mean, this is 90, this is 84, you know, it, it's, it's a little bit, you know, uh, a couple years into, into it, but I have a couple on the road pictures. I just want to ask you about the, the, the sort of, I, I like this picture a lot here. Um, this on the road picture, uh, you're, 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 here you go. Take a look at this one. Hold on. It's, uh. This is this is really uh, here you go boom with the U with what the hell kind of car is that it looks like a is that a hearse what is that this gigantic it's, uh, it's, it, 
Yeah, yeah, Chuck Stilton's Black Hearse. And, 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 and I love how you toward. connected the, U, the U-Haul thing up on top, you know? <laughs> yes, that's yeah. where the bodies went, right, exactly, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, that was very fun. I remember, I didn't, I didn't see Minneapolis on that list of uh, let me, shows. Let me look again, but here's another shot. This is, oh, yeah, it is a hearse. I, I didn't really even realize it when I looked at this picture. This is a great shot right here. That's a nice shot, yeah. I remember when we had a yeah, no, that Sunday, thing is a, that a, thing is a that thing's a tank, man. Oh, it was great to tour in though. It was cool. Um we uh we had a Sunday afternoon show um down south somewhere, like um I don't know, in Virginia or somewhere like that. And you know, we went through like a you know um a, maybe a black part of town and it was in the morning we were going through slow, we didn't know <laughs> you know, where the club was. And everyone everyone stood up and they put their hands over their hearts for the hearse going by, oh. you know, <laughs> the Sunday morning. And, right. you know, it was funny, but it was kind of, it was sad too, but anyway. <laughs> somebody asked, somebody asked, where did that photo come from? I hope these are posted somewhere to preserve as these are amazing. To tell you the truth about these photos, interestingly enough, I had these photos. Someone gave me these photos when I did the Boston Hardcore film, you know, uh, 12 years ago. And I had them in a folder. And when I was researching the show, I looked in the folder and found tons of these photos. Do, do you remember, Cliff? One of the guys, I think one of the guys in the band sent me those photos who, who was in the band at the time. Might have been that might have been Ron, maybe. Someone sent it me. It could have been photos. Ron. Someone sent me like a whole fuckload of photos. And uh, let me see if I have any more. Um, Might have been me. I don't know. Was it? No, nah, I don't know. Here, here's a, here's another one. This is a great one, man. This is a really great one. Um, and I want to I want to ask you about this. Um, this is you playing CBGB, and the reason I know that it's CBGB is because if you look, anybody out there? Can anybody out there? Anybody out there? Tell me who's in the front of who's sitting on the stage in the front of this photo. Let's see. Let's see if anybody has a, a keen eye for this sort of thing. Because, it, I mean, obviously it's CBGB, but, you know, right up in front. Uh, did you guys, did you guys, uh, any, any, yes, that's right. It's Jimmy. It, it's Jimmy G from Murphy's Law. So did you guys oh, enjoy yeah. I know you guys came down a lot and played CBs. A any, any like New York memories? Did you enjoy coming down to New York back then? Oh, uh, we you know, we love playing down, playing there. I mean, the most memorable shows <laughs> for me are the uh, the most recent ones, um, probably because my memory's shot. But um, we played um in the last what four months they were open. When when did Agent Orange and the Adolescents play last there? Those are the last two shows we played. At the, at well, the, I remember. At the I, I remember. I remember. Excuse me. I remember, which is where this picture was taken. Uh. I went and saw you play at a place called Grand Victory, and uh, that was in Brooklyn. This was this is going back ten years. Um, we took this picture together ten years ago. Um, yeah, you played, you played Grand Victory. I'm sure you've probably come back since then. You know, but yeah, <laughs> maybe not. I think mean, that was 2015, wasn't it? Could be. Yeah. Yeah, be. the last U.S. tour. Scott yeah, Morrison, right. he drives with us now. Yeah, yeah. So that that uh, that said, um, I know that there was a point in um, in uh, you guys took a, you guys took a break, like in '89. Did, did you just was it just were you tired of running the race? What what, what I, I and I know the break didn't last long. Was it was it legal issues? Was it what, 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 what? Yeah, no, what? It, it, it was, you know, I started just to talk about it. It was um, when Rapid Reaction was came out, you know, we were ready to tour again and, you know, the momentum was building for us and stuff and the uh, the flip side comp had come out. Wow. And um, then Modern Method, they just disbanded, you know, and they couldn't do any promotion for it. They just didn't repress it. And we just got kind of, we just was disheartened and did nothing, yeah. you know? 
um, you know, we didn't know how to, we, didn't, we basically didn't know how anymore to, right. to handle our, our own business, you know, and we, we could, we've never found, we never could find a good manager or one that really fit with us well, mm. you know, which is probably what we lacking the most over the years, you know, it was yeah. a, someone to take care of the business and just let us write the songs. Right. But. And, and what brought yeah, you back? What brought you back? But you took a year or two off, and then you came back together, right? Yeah, we took we took we took, we took from eighty seven to ninety off. Right. So yeah, we were three four years off. Um, and what brought us back was I, uh, me and Bill had written four songs. Um, I I'd, I'd gone in the studio to record them, and we had that as you know to shop around, and. That's when we hooked up with Curtis, mm. who was the first one to want to put it out. And, we and that you know, was wanted to add six misery, songs to it, and that became Misery Loves, Loves Company. Misery Loves Company. So he's the one that helped resurrect us, which I guess I'm thankful for that, Curtis. Thank you. Right. But I hate you for everything else. <laughs> and, um, oh, God. I, I, okay, I, I was in a good mood again. That name right. came up again. I'll get, I'll, I'll get you. I'll, oh, I'll, I can't, I'll get I can't you take that guy. I'll get you. I mean, just so you know, I don't know if you know uh, One False Move. Do you know that album? Yeah, that that was. Uh, the one every Gory did the cover for? Uh, that's not. No, let me look it up. One False Move. One False Move. Was it an EP? I can't hear you. Can you? Yeah. Can you, can you hear me? Hello, hello. Oh, well. uh oh! All right, let me. What's take, going on here now? I'm, I'm, I'm gonna take a. I'm gonna take. I'm gonna take a sponsor break. <laughs> it's that kind of a party. Um, let me take a sponsor break. Um, this is the New York Hardcore Chronicles live, and we are sponsored by New York Hardcore Comics six 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 New York Hardcore Comics, the Organic Grill. The Texas Silver Rush, DTFM Vinyl Distro, Generation Records, Mad Vintage, and 126 Hardcore Clothing. They're a streetwear brand for restless individuals who don't compromise. They're about being positive, spontaneous, and true to yourself. For years, they experimented with several printing methods and materials and collaborated with a large number of designers and illustrators, always giving room for fresh perspectives while retaining the hardcore attitude. Get in touch with them. Ramp up your game at www.126clothing.com. Last but not least, the Texas Silver Rush, they're a jewelry design firm and boutique store located in the birthplace of the Texas country music scene in Fredericksburg, Texas. They specialize in working with musicians and all music genres to design and create unique one-off pieces, as well as to style them for stage, album covers, promo photos, and social media exposure. Their client list includes Rock Roll Hall of Famers, Greg Relay, Ringo Starr, and of course, Agnostic Front. Information online sales are being taken at their Facebook and Instagram pages, and of course, www.thetexassilverrush.com. Want to talk about a couple of events coming up. Hey, who's going to be in Philly on Friday? I will be. Biohazard is playing in Philly. I am coming down. I will be there. Hopefully, I'll see you. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, this Friday night, April 12th. Uh, Saturday, April 20th. Once again, I am moderating the Ray Capo from Punk to Bu from Punk to Monk book event. This one up at our very own Bridge Nine Records in Beverly, Massachusetts. This is Record Store Day, Saturday, April 20th. It's going to be a great event. Everybody in that area, come on through. Because the next day I will be hustling. I will be hustling my ass back to New York City because the next day is the New York Hardcore Chronicles proudly presents the Back to the New York Hardcore Roots Music Series, all ages free, Sunday matinee at the Bowery Electric with Faded Line, the Car Bomb Parade, Brick by Brick, Kings Never Die, and of course, Fahrenheit 451. Jesse Mallon benefit in our beloved Tompkins Square Park on April 27th with War Orphan, The Capturers, Murphy's Law, Mad Bull, and Go Go Bordello. Come on down, uh, support this, this fantastic event. Once again, back up at Bridge Nine on Saturday, May 4th, there is an art show with our very own Lori Dawn, Mike Gallup from Agnostic Front, and Christopher Michonne. That is at Bridge Nine Records. Yo, the Black and Blue Bowl is coming up. It is the 19th. And uh, is, it the, is it the 19th? I always struggle. No, it's the 18th and 19th at the Monarch. And then 
Saturday, May 25th, once again in our beloved Tompkins Square Park. Free show, of course, Redwoods, featuring Danny Schuler's son, Colton, Cartel, non-residents, incendiary device. It's going to jump off tonight and Rebelmatic. Rampage Fest 6, Sunday, June 2nd, upstairs, downstairs, seven bands, two stages, Adrenaline OD leading the charge. And then, of course, Sunday, July 21st, it is the Back to the Roots 50th show, uh, Free All Ages at the Bowery, Foul Pride, Redwoods, Cropsy, Staten Island Hardcore represent, Incendiary Device, it's going to jump off tonight, and Sworn Enemy, come on down. And then just announced is the the three-day tattoo convention. Lots going on. That is at Terminal 5. So that said, lot, 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 lot going on. Um, is that right? Also, Saturday, 420, punk show on Cape Cod, Hyannis at the Flashback Bar and Grill. I know. I'm not going to bring up Curtis again. I'm trying not to. Um, you know, is that right? You're going to be you're going to be there on the 27th. What's the 27th? What is the 27th? 27th, 27th. What's the 27th, bro? Oh, the show in Oh, you're going to be in New York for the show for the Jesse Mallon thing in the park? Is that right, Eddie? Oh, that's fantastic. I look forward to seeing you. Um that said, let's see uh oh, is is Cliff gone? Yo, Cliff's gone. Come back, Cliff. Hold on. Let, let me uh let me uh let me send him a message. Could that be it? It could that be it for Cliff? Come back, bro. <laughs> Let's see. Uh that said, I hope we didn't spook him. Yes, oh yes. All right, Seth Finberg. What do you say, buddy? Uh where are we? Uh, Seth Finberg playing with Blackout Shoppers. What is it? The what is it? Um, 30th anniversary, Cliff? Uh, excuse me, Seth. 30th anniversary of Blackout Shoppers. Um, yeah, this is a cliffhanger. That might be it. Could that be it for our for our guest today? You know. Let me see. I sent them a message. Come back, bro. Uh, 20th anniversary. Come on down. It is a 20th anniversary of Blackout Shoppers at Rampage Fest uh, 6. Um, what else do we got? Um, th what a crazy day today, huh? What else? Well, it's well, I know. Hopefully, he comes back. It's wide open now, kids. What do you got on your mind? Anything you want to ask. <laughs> anything you want to ask. Anything you want to do. Post it. And uh, we, will, we will comment. We want Cliff. I know. I'm a, I'm, a I'm, I'm, I'm a cheap imitation. You know? Here, you want Cliff? Um, you want Cliff? Here you go. Here's some, here's some Cliff for you. Um. Here you go. Here's an old Boston cliff shot. I think this is from Streets or something in Boston. Paradise. No, this is the Paradise in Boston. Yeah, he probably, you know what? Cliff probably got pissed off about, about the Curtis thing, and he fucking stormed off, you know? Yeah. Okay, yeah. First time YouTube crapped out at the start. YouTube didn't even get going. And first time a guest bails three quarters of the way through. Yeah, could be. There you go. Hey, Jamie, Jamie Sharapa from SSD. Yes, I'm looking forward to seeing you next weekend, bro. And of course, uh, Jamie is referring to the um, Ray Capo book event that I'm moderating at Bridge Nine Records. Uh, come on through. All, all Boston friends uh, that are watching the show, uh, please, please come on through. Um, a hey, big Joe, love your work, Drew. Thanks for all you do to represent. Well, thank you. I do it because I love it. That's my stock line. I do it because I love it. You know? Yeah. I'm, you know, so funny. Blame technology. It's the technology. Fuck the technology. Um, talk about my bio book. Oh, oh it, uh, excuse me. <laughs> Can you hear me? 
Kind of. No, not really. Oh, bro. Come on. You, you're, you're like really missed. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yep. Sit back down. Yep. I can hear you. Yep. Um, okay. Well, we'll, we'll try it. I can't really, I, I don't hear well anymore, but. All right. Well, I, I, I wish there was a way I could raise your volume. Um, yeah, I can't do anything to, to raise your volume. Can you hear me? Okay. Can you hear me at all? I can hear you yeah, somewhat. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll, I'll try to talk. I'll try to talk. Uh, died, the other one, but I'll try to talk loud. Um, let, let's, uh, let's go. Let, let's hold on. Let, let me tell, uh, let me do this. Anybody out there that has questions for cliff post them now, let them fly, go deep, get weird. Hey, look who says <laughs> hi. Yo, look who says hi. Our, yeah. old, friend, our old friend, Al Burrell. Yep. Me and my, he's a, he's a Trump loving buddy of mine. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> hey, don't no, know. Good to see you. You know, you know, it warms my heart that like you guys are, it's 2024 and you guys are, dare I say friends. I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to see that. You know, we, but we both hate Trump. Yeah, right. It's a it's a rally. It's a rally thing, you know. <laughs> yeah. No, it's nice talking. It's nice. It's nice talking, Dal. It is. Yeah, yeah. I'm. I'm. I'm that, that warms my heart. Uh, Seth Finberg from uh, Blackout Shoppers asks, "How close are you to how close are you to your money goal? And is there a new album?" Um, the new album was about a third recorded. Uh, the songs are written. And um, I just got to get myself up to L.A. And uh, we just got to finish up doing it. Um, we like, yeah, we have. Are we going to play that song, Drew? Do you still have it? I, 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 gonna... I don't I don't have it. I can't I don't have I can't play it on the show. So oh, you can't. Yeah. OK. So, um, yeah, because we have that that um, that cover song. Turbo Negro. Um, and then yeah, yeah. we have uh, we've written three songs that we've recorded for the new album. And we have another eleven or so to go, um, of which will be half done after I get back up there and put vocals on the other ones. Anyway, we should be done. We we should have it out by the end of the summer. Got it. That's what we're for. Yeah. Um, here's another one. Seth. Yeah, Seth loves you, bro. Um, Tell us, hey, a, Larry Kelly says, tell us about the Edwin Gore record cover he did. I heard it was the last piece of art he ever did. Is is that the Land of the Lost cover? No, that's the um, One False Move. Well, let me let me find that as you talk about that. Go ahead. Yeah, no, um, Edward Gorey, um, I never knew, but, um, well, I, I didn't know for a long, the longest time that he lived less than a mile away from me, you know, where, my, where I grew up. Oh, and, um, oh yes, I know this cover. Yeah, go on, go on. Yeah, and um, I remember um, you know, going to some of his plays that he would put on up in you know, Buzzards Bay at you know at part of Cape Cod, and you know there'd be little little private affairs kind of thing where you know there'd be fifty people there, and I remember going up to him. He, I'd always loved his stuff, you know. I just didn't know where he was or who he was, or if he, even if he really existed, <laughs> and um. I remember going up to him at one time and asking if he'd mind it if I, I knew, I knew where he lived. His house was kind of looked like a haunted house, which was fitting. Yeah, Lori Dawn says uh, his house was a really cool place to visit on the Cape. Oh, it's, it's, it's a museum now, but it's not like it used to be, you know, they've, they've kind of de it almost. Um, I mean, when I used to go see him there, you used to, you, know, you you have to watch out. You, you're going to, you fall through the, the, the walkways, the, the, <laughs> The bushes had over, overgrown everything. You'd go inside his, his, you know, his living room, and there'd be eleven cats, and there'd, there'd be fifteen cat litter boxes around, and they'd, they'd all be cat filled, and his place would smell like cats. And but it was incredibly, like you know, uh, a, a Victorian Gothic, I guess if you want to. I guess what what he, he called it. And um, I just I, I went over and I. I said, do you mind if I come by and I have a few books? Would you mind signing them for me or something? And we get talking one day and um, I, I said, you know, um, he goes, what do you do? And I go, well, I'm an, I, I sing in a band. He goes, 
oh, what type of music do you play? And I go, we play punk. You wouldn't like it. He goes, why wouldn't I? <laughs> and I'm like, well, because I don't know. <laughs> why wouldn't you? Good question. You wouldn't like it, though. And, and his, I'm talking to a, I, I, I listen to punk rock. And he, I'm talking to a guy who's 76 years old, you know, and um, very reserved in all this. And 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 um, he goes, what, what do you what do you sound like? He goes, well, I don't know. Um, who would you know? Um, the, the Dead Kennedys. I listen to the Dead Kennedys. Why wouldn't I? <laughs> and I was like, I, I, you got me on that one. I, I great. I, I said, um, you know, we ha we have a new album that's going to be coming out um, sometime soon, and I don't know. I don't know if anyone has ever asked you this or not because I've never seen one around. But have you ever done any cover art with anybody? And he's uh, he goes, no, not really. And I was like, what, um, <clears throat> would you? <clears throat> what do you think of maybe doing one for us? He goes. <clears throat> well, let me well, let me hear this, the this, the songs and um, let me bring me a tape and I'll let you know. And so, like, he called me back like within a week after bringing him the tape, and he goes, "Oh, I love this." And I was like, "Really?" Uh -huh. <laughs> he goes, awesome. yeah, "Why wouldn't I?" I go, oh, no, "Okay, so, very wrong wrong question to ask you." And um, and anyway, he uh, he goes, "Just give me uh, give me two weeks, come back." And I go, "Well, uh, let me talk to the record company." I was we were Doctor Strange at the time, and I was like. Let me talk to the record company about what we can get you for, for you know, to pay you for the artwork. And he goes, oh, I don't want anything for the artwork. And, and he didn't either. He did it for nothing. That's and awesome, man. That's he, awesome. He just gave me, he gave me the original art afterwards. Oh, wow. I know, I know. And it's like, um, what happened, though, to it? Yeah. I lost it in a fire, uh, along with everything else that I've ever collected. In a fire? Like... It what the what? What is this? Eighteen sixty five? Like what? What is it? Like what, what are you living in? What are you living out on the fucking plains? Like a fire? No, I was I was standing in an RV and like um me uh. and this girl, me and this girl like uh, we were we we were there. We had a couple candles lit <laughs> and right. um, we put to go do something. I forget what it was. Anyway, right. and we got we got back and the whole thing was like you know just completely burnt down. It's like so it was like, like it sounds like something out of breaking like something out of breaking bad you know it was like we were living in a trailer and we were cooking stuff cooking stuff and and a fire broke out <laughs> well i mean it's i you know i always thought that our song professor red eye from that album uh the one from the album should have been the uh the theme song for breaking bad it's about it's called professor red eye and it's about a person that before breaking bad came out a person that the only guy that lives on that entire album, the only character that lives, he has he runs a meth lab and he retires after just making one big batch, right? And you know, not getting greedy, <laughs> you know, right. taking the smart. Who who did the? I, I know this is going going way back. Who who did the artwork on uh, Land of the Lost? Kevin Porter. Ke oh right, I knew that. Right. Yeah. Kevin Porter. Right. So who who Kevin Porter who. Who was the man behind uh, when we talk about the media workshop? Yeah, this is that's right. I totally forgot about it. this. Is Kevin Porter's work, right? Yeah, that, that's a great, that's a good, great album cover. It is great. It's fantastic. That yeah. that this and the gory cover are probably the, what we get asked about the most. You know, but, Cheryl Teagues. Oh, Cheryl Teagues know. for the win. You know what's that? Cheryl Teagues for the win. You know? Oh, yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, let, it, you know what? A, a lot of people. Um, uh, this album resonates with a lot of people in your catalog. Can you give us any perspective on it? Do you, do you feel like uh, looking back on it, has it aged well for you? Are you happy with it? Well, some of the songs are kind of like uh, topic specific and, you know, I don't, that's why I would never, I'm glad I didn't. And I like, I like the band Reagan youth, but I'm kind of glad I didn't, you know, we don't have songs that, is, that, that put us in a particular time period. Sure. They can, they could be relevant throughout time yeah and with this here like you know like you know no exposure is about forced exposure uh, nazi fun still is you know still is relevant to a degree but i mean and then there's other than the other side of it there's uh there's um what is it uh the, the duh family which we one of the first songs we ever wrote and you know it sounds like it was written by a bunch of 12 year olds and the lyrics are stupid um and this, 
I don't know. Yeah, I, I mean, it's hit and miss with me. I like, I, I still like a lot of it. We play, we still play four or five songs from it live, which is which is quite substantial considering you have such a a big catalog. Playing four or five songs off a single record, you know. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we we try to play what people want to hear, and a lot of people do want to hear stuff off that rabid reaction too. Yep. Did any? But, did uh. uh well, John Coletti uh, from uh, the the Anthrax. Remember the Anthrax in Connecticut? Yeah, yeah, yeah. John Coletti from the Anthrax sent me a message today about you know he's a he loves the band and was telling me about some of the great shows you played at the Anthrax in Connecticut back then. Oh, have him tell us me have him tell me about him. I yeah, can't remember right. the Anthrax. Yeah, have him have him uh, have him remind me of some of my memories. You see. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I do this. That's why I do this show because people have, you know, people kind of, kind of like tell me my memory, and then I sort of regurgitate it, and then, you know, it's a, it, it I, you know, I think it's real. You know, some, right? Sometimes those photos help me. That's that's a good thing, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know what? It, you, this this was mentioned before. I show I showed a photo before. I'm not sure which one, and somebody mentioned Bob White and Jamie from SSD uh, Control. Jamie from SSD Control, who um, is in the chat room, he, 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 yeah, he said Bob White. There he is, Bob White in that shot. And then Larry Kelly said Bob White loved the Freeze. He thought it it was the best band in Boston. Any Bob White memories? Oh, plenty of Bob White memories. I mean, there's nothing. No, no, I mean, nothing really more so than anything else. It just the guy was a character. I mean, like there was nobody like him, you know, and just uh, there'd be times when he'd get carried away where he'd want to sing along with us and I'd give him the mic and stuff. And I, I couldn't get, I couldn't get this mic back from the guy, you know, but another cool day, you know, it's like, whatever. I wouldn't just, went, I'd sing from one of the, uh, the background mics and just let him take over the show. That there was cool. He is. There he is in 19 and, and basically in front of the rat, uh, you know, uh, in, in 19, uh, probably 82, you know, and and I've said this many times. This world really misses Bob White, man. He was a really unique um, individual. He was a guy. He really was, yeah. yeah. He, he he was a he smart was, guy. He was an oh, incredibly yeah. a, incredibly smart guy, and you know, in a lot. And I hate to say it, but in in, a, in an incredible an incredibly tragic figure. He was so smart, man. You know, he he was such yeah. a fantastic, well read guy. It was really heartbreaking, really heartbreaking uh, to learn of his demise. You know, I, I you know, I, I can't, I can't help but feel that he got, he was bored by yeah. society, bored by people, yeah. to the point yeah. that you know, nothing, nothing excited him anymore. You know, he'd re he'd reached the extremes of every every avenue he'd taken, and yeah. there wasn't much left for him to enjoy. I the way I would interpret it anyway but yeah i agree with uh, you i i agree with you on that i i do i i agree he was such as 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 a as a young person he was such an incredibly unique and vibrant individual in the, in that boston scene you know he was great oh he was so, he was so enthusiastic you know and, and he, you could get carried up up and away by his enthusiasm and and we often did you yeah, know and, and it would be down some dark places here and there but that's okay Yep. You know, as long yep. as we come back out of it. Yeah. Um, Diagonal Tripod says, Echoes from, from Rabid Reaction is one of my favorites, as it always reminds me of my time in an anxiety treatment center for my agoraphobia. I always wondered, was it based on a personal experience? Um, everything I write is based on somewhat of a personal experience. Um, by the way, I... I have generalized anxiety disorder, and and if I don't take my my clonopin for it, I basically have agoraphobia. Mm -hmm. I know I won't I won't go I won't speak to people. I'm basically trapped in my own body. It's and it's, it's terrifying. It's 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 sad. It sucks. It really does. Any anxiety. I, I look at everything that I've ever really wanted to do that I've failed at in life, and I can blame it on an, on anxiety. My my mm -hmm. anxiety disorder. You know, whether it's through self-sabotage because of anxiety or whether it's just blowing something off just because, or, you know, I didn't I was too nervous to, to go there or too nervous to go play this show here or 
uh, give this guy a call for, that wanted to, us to play there. Or, or it's just everything is, is anxiety based. Everything that ever happened badly with me. You know, it's, it's what turned me on to what got me in so deep with a lot of the different drugs I've been, you know, uh, I've overindulged in. And it's just, yeah, and agoraphobia. Like, I, yeah. I, I, I remember just coming off. I, I lived, I was homeless for like four years out here. One year entirely, I lived under a tree. Wow. And some, someone stole all my stuff, including my clonopin. And I didn't, I only came out from under that tree for that month. Uh, there were about three in the morning where I could get out to a convenience store, get a jug of water, take a piss and, and uh, you know, a little bird bath type of shower, and then just go back and just try to sleep it off again. And coming off of benzos is, is worse than anything. And I come, I've come off heroin, come off all kinds of shit, but coming off benzos is the worst. Because you didn't, you, with, if you really- okay, Wait, 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 here, here, here's, wait, I got one for you. Ready? You ready? Yeah. Hardest drug to kick. What? H hardest drug to kick. Oh, benzos. Benzos. Oh, I mean, by, up, far and away. Especially for me, though, because like, you know, heroin, basically, you just- have a, a bad bad flu you know for you know today it's like two two or three days until you you, can, you take suboxone and you feel somewhat normal Ugh. but you know back before suboxone it was like you know a week or so you'd feel like you had a bad flu mm -hmm. um benzos man coming off that you can't sleep you, you the anxiety comes back at you about 50 times what it really was and if you really needed to be on them to begin with you don't know what normal is because I was I've been on them for 20 something years and I was trying to come off them after like 15 and I'd forgotten what my normal was. But when I know what my normal was, was what made me need to be on them to begin with. So the, I, I, I was stuck in this cyclical hell, mm. you know, and it, until I got until I get benzos again, you know, got prescribed them again. Um, I, I was stuck. I, I, and, and, you know, plenty of times I just won't, if I had a, if I had the right way to do it, I would have just exited the world at that point. I was that Pat down. Bald, Pat Baldwin says benzos and alcohol are by far the most dangerous to kick. Yeah, benzos and alcohol are the only two you can die coming off of. Makes sense. Um, here is, uh, here's a little, here's, hold on. Um, Crawling Blind is a very underrated album. Any thoughts on Crawling Blind from 1994? This was on Lost and Found, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. And, um, then it came out uh, together with Freak Show on um, with Doctor Strange. Ah. So it was released here. And I, I think Freak Show is a good CD, too. A, a good album, too. Um, but yeah, thoughts on this? This is the last time Steve Cataldo produced us. Right. He did. Uh, he did Rabbit Reaction. You know, from the Nervous Eaters. Steve Cataldo. Right. Yep. He did Rabbit Reaction. He produced Visual Love's Company, and he produced this one here. Um, this one here, I think, has some of the best songs on it of anything we've done. I just wish the rhythm guitars were pushed up a bit and a little more punchy than they than you know than they are in this. So sound wise, it's not my favorite, but song wise, it's one of them. Sure. Okay. Um, are you? Is it just looking looking ahead to the future a little bit? Are you guys? I see. Are you guys playing Rebellion? What, what's 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 the uh, what's what's the what's the, what's on the agenda for for the freeze? Anything? Or, or is this or is this or is this gig is this gig in keeping with uh tradition is this gig in question yeah yeah <laughs> um and it's it's it, but again like like you asked me before it's it's not the last one was you know i had got arrested for something and um everyone thought i was going to be held for the weekend or something i wouldn't make the flight out but i i did get let go and i was you know i <laughs> i didn't have to pay i didn't have to put any bail down or anything like that um anyway so i could have actually made that that tour that we didn't go on but i didn't anyway um yes we uh um now that i know i'm not going to be homeless 
and I do have this, uh, I have to have surgery on an ear, uh, that ear again. That's going to put me out for like eight weeks. So out of commission. So I want to get the, uh, the new album. It's going to be called 911 to nowhere. <laughs> and it's going to be like a post apocalyptic type of thing without seeming that it's mainly written about, uh, you know, getting older and visualizing death. So it's going to be a real happy one. <laughs> And um, it should be out by the end of the summer. It's going to be called 911 to Nowhere. And uh, I just actually finished writing a news, writing lyrics for one of the songs that I needed to write um, just few, is, about last week. Is so, the whole band is the whole band in the Ariz in Phoenix in the Phoenix area? No, no, no. As a matter of fact, none of us are anywhere near each other. Yeah, that um, makes it tough. that makes it tough, huh? Right now, it's just three of us. I mean, we we have plenty of people that can you know can hop in as we've had fifty five different members in the past. But um, so I mean, we, we, we thankfully we get along with almost everybody that we've you know past members. And um, anyway, yeah. So we but Bill lives in Bill Close lives up in um Studio City, part of L A. Um, that's where the studio is. I have to fly up there. Scott Mollison's drumming with us. And um, you know, doing some of the vocals, and he's in New York City, mm -hmm. so he fly from there. And anyway, so um, we'll get that done. We'll get the album done, and as soon as I can get my uh, the health issues addressed, then we're gonna start playing again. I'm I'm dying to play. I'm dying to I'm dying to see you, man. I really am. I, well, I'm, yeah. I'm, I really it'd be great really... to see everybody again. And, and let, while, while I have while I'm still on. Thank I wanted, I wanted to thank everyone that helped me out uh, during the, for the GoFundMe I just uh, had. Uh, you know, I, I, again, it's it's hard to believe the, uh, the 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 goodness and the friendly outpouring of just not. I mean, I don't, I don't mean financial donations as much as the sharing, the kind words, just you know, the, every everything that people have you know have done. I thank you because awesome. it, it, brought, it brought tears to my eyes. You know, and, and yeah, people would. Kind of thing. The the community the, the the community rallied. Well, it, it, yeah, yeah, and it, they do it again and again and again, and it's like there's there's no way to really thank people yeah. enough for that kind of behavior. Yeah, it's it, too little of it today, I think, just overall. But there's plenty of it within this genre. L Lori you know? Lori Dawn says, "Hope you can play Cape Cod." Do you ever go back to? Like, have you? When was the last time you made it back to like the ghost town that is known as Cape Cod? Yeah, and, and I, it, the last time we toured, is it creepy? Was last, stayed with my my mother's back there, you know, and uh, I, I got to get back and see her. She's eighty, right? And you know, she's not gonna be around forever. So, although you never know, she's probably gonna outlive me. Her mother lived to be a hundred and four. Hey, and, we uh, just did we just did the Ray Capo book event, and his mother came. She's ninety seven, you know. Yeah, I heard that. That's that, that was wild. Yeah, yeah. It was. Yeah. It was uh, I don't want to say. I don't, don't want to say anything to jinx her, but right. <laughs> but yeah, that's okay. That's what, uh, yeah. my my grandmother. She broke her hip at, at, when she was ninety seven, yeah, and it happens. She, she lived to one hundred and four anyway. Yeah, that that hap that happens a lot. Um, we went through yeah. that with my dad. It's like. They don't want to go into a, they don't want any help. And then they fall and they break their hip and they end up in a hospital and then they go to a rehab and then they never come home. After that, they have to yeah. go to a, yeah, you know, so. Yeah. 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 I remember my grandmother, she, she actually lived, I think, too long. And it, it, it it's actually been the inspiration for a couple of the, the set of the lyrics I've written for the new album where she mm. would sit down and me, she'd be like, Clifton, all my friends are gone. Why am I still here? I don't want to be. I don't want to be. Why am I? I'm your friend. Why do you don't talk like that? I'm your friend. You know, I I, I love yeah, you, Grandma. It's tough. It's tough. And, you know, she, uh, yeah. Um. Let me ask you, why Phoenix? Why'd you end up moving from what the Cape to Phoenix? How'd you end up? What What was it about? How'd you end up in Phoenix, Arizona? Well, this guy David Barbie, D Bar D, uh, D B David Barbie. Um, yeah, yeah, I remember DB, Yeah, he came out and stayed with us along with the this guy Zach. Um, 
from Phoenix. He stayed with us. They stayed with us on the Cape for a bit and then told me and my wife at the time. Remember Marsha Jones? Mm -hmm. Do you? Yeah. Yeah. Is, I, is that met. is that your wife at the time? That's not. No, we're still yeah. we're still married. But we're not yeah, like Marcia. together. Yeah, Marsha. Yeah. Marcia, yes. Yeah. Yes. I mean, is she, she's we in Arizona. Married. Is she still in Arizona? Yeah. We Yeah, and I'm still. We're still friends and all that. Um. She, she's. We were almost too much alike to have been together. Yeah. Uh, two chaotic people getting together. That's always problematic. It was, yeah, it's either going to be like we're going to like you know bounce the right way together, or we're going to bounce against each other in a way, mm -hmm. and both have happened. But anyway, um, what was I saying though? Oh, what, and then so did Bobby, Dave, Bobby told us that all we had to do was move out to Phoenix. We never have to pay rent <laughs> because rents was, you know, was cheap here, but but all we could play shows. He was a guitarist with us for a long time. Um, play shows we could play like the circuit we could go to texas denver you know uh california phoenix and and and, and yeah we just played that whole there's that whole uh that's that whole southwest circuit yeah yeah and he'd go, yeah we played the circuit once a month you never have to pay rent never get a job or that worked for one month <laughs> and then you know like we then i you know we're waiting to get more shows for the next month and then we get evicted you know, and that was this was like ten years ago, you know, and that began my four year four year homeless run, where I get you know picked up on two different drug charges and picked up two drug felonies right after I cleared up my fifty charges I found was found guilty of back in Massachusetts. <laughs> I had to I had to soil myself out here legally too, but I'm yeah. off. I'm off. What? I'm out of the system now. Oh, that's good. Which is I was going to ask. I was. I was going to ask. Does that does that hinder? Is that why I haven't seen you play in a while? Does that hinder your sort of travel plans? No, 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 not at all. Um, no. As a matter of fact, like uh, when we did tour, I had to get the. Uh, I got the okay from my probation officer to do the tours, and right, it's, it how, it's how you earn a living, right? It's how you well, earn a living. I need exactly. To violent yeah. drug shots. I mean, it's not like I'm. Uh, threat to anybody except hey, myself uh, uh, My michael larouche asks any boston bands you really thought should have made it like back back in the let's say back in those early anybody who you just felt you know were, were really great and for whatever the reason sort of didn't make it to the promised land any anybody come to mind the outlets who the outlets oh the outlets yeah I mean, I don't know if you're looking. They want you're looking for a heavier band. No, band, no, but, any, any, anything, anything at all. I, anything mean, at all. I, I always thought the moving target should have been bigger than they are. Mm -hmm. Proletariat was always a great band. Yeah, I liked them. They, they were great. They were great. Gang Green actually got as big as I thought they were, you know could get. Yeah. Well, oh, by the way, oh, by the way, speaking of Gang Green, Alec Peters wanted me to say hello to you. Oh really? Yeah, that, that's cool. Tell Alex. Yeah, I like to Alex say yeah. hello to Alex. Hope you know him in a while. Remember last time I talked to Alex, we were going to get a show together with Gang Green, but then Chris got you know had the stroke or whatever. How's he doing? Do you know? Yeah, I, actually, he came to uh, my my new film screened in his uh, in his town in Florida, and he came to he came to the film festival, and we spent some time together. That was like less than a year ago. He's down in Florida. It, my my film uh, screened in Jupiter, Jupiter, Florida. So okay, um, yeah, he, he he's doing it. I've mobile? actually I've how, how mobile is he? What's that? How mobile is he? He's good. He's fine. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. No he's way. Good. That's great. That's great to know. Yeah, I'm glad. Uh, yeah, Pig Champion says I discovered the freeze very late. One false move LP. One false move LP. And then worked my way backwards through their records. I literally couldn't believe that so much good music had passed me by. Exceptional. Hey, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, that's yeah. what I was going to say. One false move has a song kind of on it called "Contract High," where uh, you know it, it was. Uh, I wrote it for Curtis. Ah. One yeah. day you'll check your mail. Good morning, letter bomb. No prints, no paper trail. <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck oh. that guy. So yeah, now we're going to end the show on a fucking negative note now because I had to think of that guy again. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> um, the 
James G. Warrior asks, any newer bands that you feel still carry on that freeze style of hardcore doing it today? Um, I no, I think well, I, 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 I yeah, I'm sure there are. I just I yeah. don't. I don't get a chance to, I don't have any money because I don't really work. I'm retired, by the way. Of course. I'm retired, and, I, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to live off of what I've worked. <laughs> I'm going to have to live off Social Security, and I've worked, I've, I've, I I've worked, on, I've worked on the books four days <laughs> yeah, <of my> life. <laughs> I just barely earned enough for Social Security to collect it. I'm going to be living off $472 a month for the rest of my life. Right. <laughs> Be, be, so, better get better get the band up and running, bro. Yeah. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna decay somewhere on the side of the road as a fuck. I'm no 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 no. I'm gonna I'll, I know how to I know how to leave here peacefully, and yeah. which I'll do at the right point. Was uh the right was point. one was one false move a reference to Jack Kerouac? No, no. Um, how how would it be? I, I'm not sure. James G. Warrior asks. One false move is a reference to Jack Kerouac, right? No, yeah, I don't know how that. Would, I I don't know enough about Jack Kerouac. I've read a, I've read Dharma Bums and On the Road. That's it. But yeah, um, right. um, what was I going to say? One false move and you're dead, basically. And because all the characters except one on that album, I I killed off, died in different ways, and that's yeah. what Edward Gold trying to portray on that cover. That little character he has up on that on that swinging sign amongst the urns in the mausoleum mm -hmm. um, is a character he's titled Nub, and Nub shows up in the last book he did as an <laughs> orphan found no as, as a as a child found orphaned at his parents' gravesite, <laughs> mm. and you know that's that's the, the character he puts up the you know one one false move and that guy is going too, so. Gotcha. Be careful what you do. I guess you know that's the that's the lesson I I gotta have to say. From, All right. Be careful and, what you guys get involved in. Be careful what you do and just try to do it right and don't hurt anybody else. There. Yeah. Well, on on that note, um, I want to thank you for coming on the show. Um, no, I thank appreciate you. it. Yeah, it, it it was really nice uh, to chop it up with you again. It's been a long time, and I'm certainly looking forward to seeing you play. Uh, if you could, if you you know, if you get the the machinery rolling. Anybody you want to thank? Anybody you want to shout out? Uh, Bill Close, if you're listening, Scott Mollison. But again, and everyone that like had took part in helping me out with that GoFundMe. Again, thank you, thank you very much. You guys, I'll never forget that. Yeah. All right. Thanks, man. I'll talk to you soon, Cliff. Okay. Bye, bye, Drew. Take care. Hey, Larry. Well, there you go. Cliffhanger from the freeze. Uh, nice to talk to him. Um, great show. We 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 fought through it, and so thanks for hanging in there. I'm sorry for the weird technical glitch. Like I said, any fluctuation in the matrix like freaks me out. So I had to. Yeah, it took some. It took some. Thank you, Lou. Um, if you're wondering uh, what's going on, just want to let everybody know I will be in Philly on Friday with Biohazard, and we will be back here on Sunday, co-hosted by Howie Abrams with John Conley from Nuclear Assault. Is that right, Lori? That made that actually made you, yeah. I mean, I guess it's like, is it safe to say like that cliffhangers like cape cod punk rock like legend icon i mean i don't know any other punk rock are there any other punk rockers like that came out of cape cod you know james g warrior thanks for doing this clip you're awesome glad you're still alive drew i'm like the biggest fan i'm glad i finally got to interact with you you're the biggest fan of his okay good don't be a big fan of mine <laughs> <laughs> First time I saw Nuclear Assault in 1989 at Sundance was with Sick of It All and Killing Time. Well, we're going to talk about all that, man. Uh, Sunday is going to be a really great show. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Howie Abrams, love when he's on here co-hosting. It's going to be a great show on Sunday. Um, any chance of getting Bill Stevenson on? 
you know, we tried a couple years ago. We reached out. He didn't respond. We kind of moved on. We kind of go to, you know, we go towards the light here, you know, and there are so many friggin' shows that are booked right now, you know. Um, hey, Eddie, is that right? Are you really coming to New York, Eddie? We're going to see you for the uh, for that park show. Is that right? You know, Massachusetts represent. Thanks for thanks for this. Mojo Jojo. Yeah. My pleasure. Good. I'm looking forward to it, Eddie. Hopefully we have a nice day in the park, right? We might play that night in, at the after show. We'll see. There's some, there's some chatter. Oh, here's a cool flyer that I didn't post during the show. This is the last thing. Great. God. Look at this show. Where is this? Media Workshop. You know what? L look at this show. Uh, SSD Control Gangrene The Freeze. November 1st, 1981. Wow. Look at that. That's, that's, you know, and I, I was at this show. These are all the shows that I saw early on. You know what? You, you, you want to see, you want to see a, you want to see a picture of, of, of what the hell did I just do? Oh, um, you were six. You, you want to see, okay. You want to see me at this show? I actually have a picture. There's probably a picture of me at, at that show because a bunch of pictures showed up. I'll show you. Media Workshop. Let me see if I can find a picture of that show. Uh, yeah, here you go. Boom. Well, no. Well, I probably took, I probably took this picture. Uh, but wait, let me see. Uh... Yeah. All right. You got to see these. I mean, we, 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 we've sort of, we, we, we've poked around with these pictures before, but here's a picture that I took at that show, what I believe to be that show in 1981. I took this picture of SSD control at, at the media workshop, about 25 kids there. I took this with like one of those little like Canon sure shots, you know, and here is, here is another shot of me at the show taken by Phil and Flash. Check me out. I'm, I'm behind that speaker with the camera in my hand. Check that out. You see me there with the camera, with the camera in my hand. So I have pictures of them playing, and then there's other pictures of me taking pictures. That's crazy, right? Great, great shot. This is Media Workshop. That's Springer. This is an SSD Control Show, 1981. So anyway, enough of me talking about me. Um, there you have it. And uh, the SG. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is that right? cro in New Hampshire tonight. No, I didn't lose my camera. I, I, you know, I lived with that camera. That was a Canon Sure Shot. You just and it had a little little timer on it. You could like turn the thing and put it somewhere and take a picture. Canon Sure Shot. You know. Thank you, Rue on the loose. Thank you, everybody. It was a nice show. Great guest. See you on Sunday, or maybe I'll see you in Philly. Tell your loved ones that you love them. It is so important in this life. Until then, do good things and good things will come to...